Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone. My name is Christina Delisio and I'm an economic development specialist in the community development department. This is the sourcing and waste reduction webinar hosted by the economic opportunity and development division. The division is housed in the Cambridge community development department, also known as CDD and is committed to building an inclusive and sustainable economy in the city of Cambridge. The division is responsible for a wide range of activities designed to meet the city's need for a vibrant, innovative, diverse, and thriving economic base that ensures economic opportunity for all. To learn more about the division, you can visit cambridgema.gov backslash CDD backslash economic opportunity and development. This webinar is part of many wider efforts. Uh, first, this webinar is part of a Green Restaurants mini series hosted by our friends at Prep Shift. And second, the Green Restaurant series is part of our Food Business Incubator Workshop Program through the Economic Opportunity and Development Division. The second workshop of the series is actually coming up next week on June 7th, same time as this webinar, and it will be about energy efficiency and packaging. That webinar will have a focus on practical tips with the best return on your time and financial investment to green your facilities and improve your packaging. And I will share a link to that particular webinar in just a moment. And on the topic of things that will be shared and how this will run, I just want to quickly go over some quick housekeeping. Uh, so this webinar is, as of right now, very much being recorded. And it will get posted to our website so that folks can view it at a later time or share with their friends. Uh, next, folks are probably noticing that they uh, are muted and that their video has been disabled, but we do have chat feature enabled and we also have the Q&A enabled. So throughout the webinar, I will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A to help assist with any questions that come up. Uh, for this webinar, we will also have a copy of the presentation slides available at a later time. Um, so let's dive in. It is my great, great pleasure to have Carla Cornejo of PrepShift here today leading our webinar. Uh, PrepShift was started because the team saw that restaurant businesses weren't getting the help they needed, especially the ones that really needed help. PrepShift now offers workforce training, coaching, consulting, and workshops. So tell all your friends. And I'll now turn it over to Carla to more fully introduce herself and to get us started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina, for that really wonderful introduction. Thank you, everyone that's joining us today or that might be watching this recording. Um, we are so excited to talk to you about how to source better and waste less in your food business. All right. So um, just like Christina mentioned, PrepShift is a tech-enabled restaurant consultancy and we are really committed to helping independent restaurants create the most sustainable businesses possible in every sense of the word. Um, this is our small but mighty team comprised of our CEO, Irene Lee, who is also the owner of May May Dumpling Factory in South Boston, if you haven't paid her a visit. Uh, my colleague, Dylan Gully, who's our CFO, and myself, Carla, um, our COO. And why sustainability matters. Before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that we're addressing these topics in a moment when restaurants are really struggling in a lot of different ways. We know that the restaurant industry is a massive contributor to environmental problems and, um, and climate change, but the good news is that we also have the potential to have a really positive impact as well. There's pressure coming from all directions for restaurants to be more sustainable. Our guests are more sustainability minded. Local and state and federal government are implementing more bans and mandates. And of course, the, co the cost of everything is just going up so quickly. And often our internal teams, our employees are also pushing towards sustainability and they wanna be proud of the businesses that they work for. And you personally may also be invested in creating a more sustainable business, but maybe you don't know exactly how or you feel like you can't afford it. So we're hoping that this mini series will help address some of those concerns. So our goal through um, this series that is so wonderfully sponsored by the city of Cambridge CDD is to provide you with more tangible and actionable steps that you can take in your business to not only save money and reduce food waste, but to have a positive impact on the environment as well. 
like Christina mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about topics that really affect restaurants. And today we're going to, it's all going to be about food sourcing and uh, waste. And next week we'll talk about facilities management and sustainable packaging to areas um, that can really contribute to your overhead costs. And so a little bit more about how we at Prep Shift really think about profit and the triple bottom line. Um, in a lot of businesses and maybe in your business right now, really it's it's the money that's kind of left over after you've paid all of your bills. That's the type of profit that we think about. But we um, firmly believe that profitable businesses can and should be good for the people that work in them, for them, and that patronize them and the planet. And these three goals can support one another. You don't have to sacrifice profitability for sustainability or vice versa. And we think that businesses that figure out how to prioritize people, planet, and profit are the ones that will ultimately survive this difficult period in our economy. So for today's objectives, we are going to talk about some ways that you can improve your sourcing and things to look out for, some strategies for reducing food waste in your restaurant, and how to maximize ingredient quality and utilization so that you're saving money while sourcing better. So best of both worlds. And uh, really importantly, getting your team engaged in these efforts. So for today, uh, again, we're going to talk about understanding some food labels, better sourcing better products, different types of vendors. We'll dive into the particulars of food waste, what the ingredient life cycle might look like in your own business, and then wrap up in some time for Q&A. All right, so let's get started. So you're probably here because you want to do things differently, and uh, we believe that you can do it. Uh, but you're also faced with some challenges and it's natural for any of us to fall back into old habits and ways of thinking that can be limiting. So we want to start off by emphasizing that as you think about uh, making a more sustainable business, it's really important to be flexible and creative in your approach and to focus on the relationships both with your customers, your team, and your uh, vendors. And we'll touch more on that later. So some common concerns that we hear from operators um, as we get into these topics is, I can't afford these changes. While that's often the case when it comes to sourcing local, combining some of these efforts with waste reduction it has a lot of potential to impact your profit and not eat it all up. Um, we've always done it like this. That doesn't mean you should keep doing it. That's something else that we hear. Sometimes operators are afraid of how their teams will react to change or how that experience is being communicated appropriately. And so a lot of what we're going to suggest in terms of practical tips involves small changes that work if you're open-minded and if you stick with it. And what we're really advocating for is not completely changing your operations overnight, but focusing on the small achievable changes that will uh, really build up and have an impact over time. Um, so before we jump into talking about ingredients, we're gonna talk about some labels and jargon that you might see in the food industry and food labeling generally, um, so that you know what you're looking at. So beware greenwashing. You're gonna see so many buzzwords out there, even in the grocery store when you're interacting with vendors that serve to make um, the product or the business more appealing to customers, but might not exactly mean anything in particular. For example, you see menus that talk about local food and how do we even define local? Some people might think of it as um, food that's sourced from 100 miles away. Some think of it as 500 miles away as still local. Uh, Words like natural, humane, eco-friendly, sustainable, ethical are not regulated. So really it's kind of in the eye of the beholder as to what those really mean. And sometimes that serves to just promote a product or charge more for it. Um, there are some labels that are defined, um, but they can vary in scope and they can be misleading at times. These labels here um, can represent a variety of certifications that are verified by third parties. And in many cases, these can be either narrow or broad in scope, and they can be very expensive to obtain. Uh, we talked about them being potentially misleading. And what we mean by that 
is like, let's take a look at the certified humane seal, for example. It has a really pretty picture of rolling hills on it. It maybe makes you imagine a beautiful farm with animals wandering around grazing. But in reality, many farmers who raise animals with the certified humane seal have animals that never leave their barns. And something else to consider sort of the converse of that is that uh, many farmers use organic practices but can't afford the certification process. So it's not to say that these labels are bad by any means, but they don't necessarily tell the whole story. So how can you learn more about where your products come from? Um, before we get more into that, we want to really think about what matters to you and what does better sourcing mean to you? Is it something that has a smaller carbon footprint and environmental impact? Is it about animal we welfare? Are you especially concerned with how workers are treated and compensated or guest and human health? None of these things exist in a vacuum and you could be concerned about any number of them. Um, so you certainly want to choose and emphasize what you'd like to, to prioritize and be ready to explain those choices to your team and guests. And when we talk about sourcing philosophies and what we prioritize, here are a few examples of businesses that have sustainable practices and put that those issues at the center of their marketing strategy. Be Good, a local favorite, really focuses on grass-fed and locally raised proteins. Same thing, Clover, climate-friendly and seasonal. Life Alive is plant-based and organic. May May Irene's, um, Irene's shop uses pasture-raised meats only and has really close relationships with farmers that they trust. So once you've narrowed down what your philosophy is when it comes to sourcing, it's time to think about what ingredients you actually want to work with and what those and how you can meaningfully improve upon them. And this is what we want everyone to really keep in mind is that what matters is incremental progress. So let's start with produce, fruits, and vegetables. Not all distributors will say where their produce is coming from, so you may have to ask in advance or read labels really carefully. Uh, I know some businesses stay away from Californian produce because of the drought conditions there. So again, it comes back to what's important to you. We have a long winter season here in New England, so sourcing a uh, variety from local farms isn't always an option. But the good news is that many of our local farmers uh, freeze and preserve products in ways that they don't need to be seasonable and can still be used, but it is also still likely that you will need to source crops from other places. And for small, smaller farmers, volume is always going to be a challenge. The smaller the farm, the harder it is going to be for them to provide um, everything that everyone needs at a given time. So we advise you to be flexible with substituting different items in and out insofar as your menu and concept allow. And uh, you don't want to totally change your, your dishes, but if you can't get scallions, for example, you might be able to use spring onions or green garlic or sweet onions, etc. cetera. Um, so thinking about those close substitutions that you could make um, in your dishes will give you a lot more flexibility. And farmers markets can be a really great place to meet farmers and learn more about what they have available and how they like to work. Uh, you probably don't necessarily wanna do your restaurant shopping there. Um, that can get really expensive really fast, but it's a great way to start building those relationships um, that can make a difference in the long term. And the other good news, especially in such an innovative place like Boston, uh, we are seeing growing innovations that are helping to improve availability year round. And we'll talk more about that shortly. So um, just to give you a more concrete example, here's how farmer relationships have changed the uh, May May's menu. So they were working with the food project and this is a great example of relationship building. Uh, we talked about scallions. A little bit, but you may have noticed that when you go to the grocery store, all store all of your scallions come trimmed, and so when May May went to go visit the urban farm in Dorchester for the food project to pick up produce, they realized that the scallions were all being trimmed, and sometimes that meant that more than two feet of green was being cut off. 
So they started asking the food project to reserve those for May May. And so not only did that generate extra uh, revenue for the food project, which is, which is such an excellent organization, but it also helped May May increase their supply. And when they had space, they could also stock up their freezer. Another local favorite and someone who's doing things just a little bit differently is Little Leaf Farms. Uh, they grow their greens in a greenhouse. They have a hydroponic system. And so their growing technology means that there's more and more availability year round. And May May buys a lot of their salad greens from Little Leaf. If you've had them, they are the best. They are super crunchy and juicy. Um, it was a favorite staff snack and something that I really enjoy as well. And they and the big thing is that they really last in the fridge for literally weeks at a time while maintaining their crispiness. And so again, that mitigates food waste because we're not throwing out soggy greens and we can support a local organization like Little Leaf. So now let's talk about meat, eggs, and dairy. These are really tough and the climate impact really depends on how the animals are raised as you can see from the chart. Beef is really bad at 15 kilograms of GHG per serving, but it can also be as low impact as four. When we talk about the climate impact of beef, for example, we're talking about factory farms specifically. But if we're thinking carefully about raised beef, it might actually be better than, for example, the most intensively farmed lamb. Um, generally speaking, pork and chicken are slightly better for the climate than beef. But of course, that's not the only marker of, marker of quality. We also want to keep in mind how animals are treated and are slaughtered. Um, the best option here to learn more is to visit the farm if you can or meet the farmers. You should understand the labels that they use and why they choose those and not others. If you can be flexible with your cooking, you might be able to choose cheaper cuts and get a good result. A good example of this is birria tacos. We've been seeing them trend for a couple of years now. And compared to flank steak, you can use really inexpensive cuts to braise and make a really delicious product. Now moving on to seafood, which is the pride and joy of New England. This can be really challenging because of overfishing and the poor health of our oceans in general. A lot of fish caught in the US actually get sent overseas to be processed and then get sent back to the packages that you see in grocery stores. Like with meat and eggs, it's not just the animal dimension, but how does it even get to your plate? How was it caught and where? All of this makes a huge difference. And you want to be careful because many species have a lot of different names, so labeling can be misleading. We want to give a quick shout out to Red's Best, which is local because they're based here in Boston and they provide amazing transparency. Each product has a QR code that includes the location of the catch and the fisherman who caught it. So again, if you're a versatile cook, you can swap out similar fish based on price and availability. A dish that features catch of the day might even sound more appealing. And if you might pay, say, $11 a pound for cod, you could pay half that for pollock or redfish, which are also very delicious types of white fish. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about plant-based vegan and vegetarian options. Another consideration is plant-based meats, meats like Impossible Burger or Beyond Meat. Many consumers who want to reduce their carbon footprint are actively looking for these products. Um, and also keep in mind that you don't have to serve every protein option out there. It's okay to skip items that you're not comfortable with cooking or that don't fit your cuisine or that just simply don't meet your standards. May May, for example, currently doesn't serve chicken because they can't find chicken that meets their standards um, ethically, but that is also at a reasonable price point for the scale of their operation. So this can be really frustrating for customers sometimes, but it also gives you as an owner and, and your team the opportunity to tell your story and share your values, which in our view is a net positive. All right, and so now let's talk about where you might get all of these ingredients, your vendors. When you're evaluating a new vendor, there's some questions you wanna ask. How much do things cost and do they price ahead of time? Or do you find out the price when the product arrives? What variety of products do they have? If they mostly sell produce, for example, could they have a few dry goods or disposables that you could get all in one trip? 
Um, this can be smart because you might always need a backup vendor for critical items, depending on your menu and concept. And you also want to know if the service is good. Uh, Boston is a very relationship-based city, especially in the food industry. So you should definitely talk to colleagues and other owners for references. Sometimes the rep matters more than the company. And then you want to consider how do they actually get the ingredients. Vendors are all over the map in terms of delivery days, lead times, order forms, or lack thereof. Some are very still old school systems where you got to call in your order. And sometimes you have to pay up front and others give you um, terms. So net 30 means you have 30 days to pay, for example. So there's a lot of variety and you have to figure out kind of what works for you and your business and how much capacity you have to manage all of these relationships. Um, the good news is a lot more vendors have online portals that make ordering a lot easier and more streamlined and provide a lot of information about the products that you're getting. So one type of vendor that you might be really familiar with are cash and carry stores like Restaurant Depot. You pay up front and walk out with a product and there are pros and cons to that. One thing to think about is that most of the products are only available in one type and one price. You can't really negotiate or comparison shop, which these days is something that we're really accustomed to and rely on to save money. And not to mention uh, with cash and carry vendors, most people don't factor in the time and energy that it takes to physically go and do the shopping. Next, there are broadline distributors who tend to carry at least a little bit of everything. They really vary in size. U.S. Foods, Cisco, and PFG are giant chains, but there are also smaller regionally focused broadline vendors like Baldor and one of our favorites, woman-owned Dole and & Bailey and Cats Arubas. It's worth noting that even though these huge companies sometimes carry really good products that can be local or regional. So for example, dairy from Cabot is awesome because it's a farmer cooperative. A lot of people don't realize that it's not just like one big uh, corporation. And flour that comes from King Arthur is worker owned and based in Vermont. So again, some great brands to look out for um, that support the broader ecosystem. Another place that you might buy from is a farm aggregator. Um, these are basically connectors that make it possible to buy from lots of small businesses at once. Uh, one challenge is that many of these aggregators only deliver once or twice per week. So if you're used to Cisco, for example, that means you might have to step up your inventory management practices because you will need to plan ahead a little bit more to use a service like this. Uh, but with a farm aggregator, really the, the biggest benefit is that you can comparison shop and you're really getting the freshest product um, and you're able to to receive the benefits of multiple small, small farms and aren't limited to just one. And then another way to buy is direct from farms. Ultimately, these relationships require a fair amount of research and investment, uh, mostly of your time. And not every farm is going to be the right choice for your business. It really will depend on their own logistics and your capacity to, to kind of make those meld with yours. Um, you are getting, again, the freshest product. It's coming direct from the source. And pricing will vary widely, so you really will need um, to, to do your research and your homework. But one of the, the benefits here is that there's cost savings potential as well. Uh, leftovers or B-grade product is a lot more affordable and often just as good as, as what you would be paying more for. And then there's also the opportunity to market and cross promote to loyal customers, especially on social media. They love to see vendor features. And when you have a um, beautiful product from these farms, that can really be an asset. And again, just to kind of give you an example, uh, Mamey sources their product very widely from a lot of vendors. Um, Irene wanted me to make sure to note that Mamey still also buys from big companies like Amazon. Um, no business is perfect, but most have room to improve. We want to give a big shout out here to two uh, Boston food aggregators, Food Hub and Market Mobile, which is actually based out of Rhode Island, and Mamey has worked with them for years. Do we have any questions about vendors or product at this point? 
not at this point. I've been watching the Q&A and the chat and there's nothing that's come in yet. Excellent, so we'll keep going. So now let's talk a little bit about food waste. Let's imagine that you've done an amazing job stepping up your sourcing, kudos to you, and hopefully you've been able to stay on budget and not spend much more money than you usually do. But now the challenge is to make sure that you're able to sell all this beautiful food and it doesn't go to waste. So we're going to talk about food waste generally and how you can address it in your business. Uh, so first of all, it's really important. We like definitions around here. What is food waste? Food waste is any edible food that is produced and harvested but not consumed. And the reasons really vary for why there's food waste and it kind of happens at every level of the system and we'll talk about that a little bit more. According to estimates by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, approximately 30 to 40 percent of the food supply in the U.S. is wasted. And this equates to around 133 billion pounds of food uh, worth an estimated $161 billion wasted on it every year. And where does food waste come from? So an estimated 43% of all food waste happens in households and restaurants. That's that big chunk that you see there. Um, but of that 43%, an estimated 20% is coming from restaurants alone. Although it's not our focus today, it's worth noting that household waste is actually greater than restaurant waste. So um, hopefully some of the tips that we provide today are things that you can take back um, to your own household and to your friends and family to help mitigate this massive problem. And so why do we want to reduce food waste uh, beyond the obvious? So there's a tons of reasons, but for a business, it really all comes back down to that triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. When we save money, we can budget towards our values and other priorities like um, affording that nicer produce from your local farm, uh, investing in better packaging and other green improvements for your business. So um, is it easy to reduce food waste? That is um, a question we get really often. And most chefs, anyone worth their salt, really already knows how to be good with food and how to be frugal. And in theory, it should be super simple, you know, buy less and use more of what you buy. But we see so much food waste every day that it's really easy to get desensitized. So we need systems and support and we need to prioritize um, mitigating food waste so you can avoid putting your dollars in the trash. So now we're going to talk about the ingredient life cycle and how waste happens. Uh, and the idea of reducing food waste might seem a little daunting, but I think this section will break it up into smaller parts that will help you see all the areas where you could potentially have a positive impact. Um, so again, unfortunately, food gets wasted at every step and um, not everything is under our control. At the farm and harvest level, crops are susceptible to weather and pests. In transport, there will always be issues of spoilage. But as we talked about earlier, there are ways to help farms reduce waste, like gleaning, buying B-grade produce, using up those scallion tops, basically teaming up with your local farmers and your vendors to figure out ways to use product. Uh, but as restaurant own owners, what you can really impact is the piece of this pipeline that's from the kitchen to the guest. So that's from the time that food enters your kitchen until it is served. And there's tons of opportunity. Places that you can intervene are before ordering, before prep and during storage, during prep, after prep, so when you have your mise ready on the line and with the customer. And we'll go through each of these moments and discuss some possible solutions. So stage zero. Uh, before the ingredients ever even arrive on premise. Uh, the name of the game here is knowing what you need and not over ordering. Unfortunately, over ordering and poor inventory tracking are some of the biggest contributors to food waste in restaurants. Managing your inventory is really critical to streamlining your back of house operations as well as to save money. So, um, for most people, we recommend actually tracking inventory on paper, having, having um, a, a notebook or a spreadsheet ready to go. 
And anytime we go shopping, grocery shopping for our households, we probably have a list, right? And how often do you add items to your cart that weren't on your list? I know I'm definitely guilty of that. And while this can have implications for your household budget, it can really make a huge difference in a restaurant because even if we do have a plan for sometimes for uh for an item, we can still use it, end up wasting food. And also for restaurants, we are likely buying things by the case. So the uh, volume of waste is potentially much greater than in your household. Uh, and so lastly, another thing that you can do before those ingredients ever even arrive is cutting menu items that don't sell. We work a lot with clients one-on-one -on -one and coaching them. And this is usually one of the first savings areas that we recommend. Customers are fatigued by long menus, and it's really hard to train your back of house team on a very expansive menu. So it can really benefit both your customer and you um, in terms of your revenue uh, to shorten that menu. So the next stage is before you prep ingredients. You place an order and your ingredients have arrived, but maybe you're not ready to prep them yet. It's still super important to stay organized and inspect your deliveries as they arrive. Maybe those tomatoes are a little more ripe than you anticipated, so you may need to prep them sooner than you planned. Um, if you personally do not receive deliveries, making sure you spend a little bit of time training staff members who might be receiving those and making sure that they check before they just let um, the delivery person leave for the day. So some tips for perishable inventory management include establishing FIFO practices in your kitchen. Uh, and just to make sure everybody knows what that means, it's first in, first out. This method helps assure that goods purchased um, or produced first are sold first. So that means that your oldest inventory is what's getting served to your customer before your newer inventory, which can sound a little counterintuitive. But by organizing your walk-in with the oldest items in front of you, you don't have to check the dates every time you need something in a hurry. And next, you want to make sure that you're storing everything properly. Many ingredients do not have a good shelf life in the containers that they come in, or they can be hard to organize. So repackaging into sturdier containers or cambros, um, which are clear, can really help. And then make sure you're designating an eat first shelf in your walk-in. Uh, this probably happens at home too, where there are ingredients that are kind of in the back of the fridge and are out of sight and out of mind. Uh, things that need attention could have an altogether different shelf set aside for them so that they get the attention they deserve. And preservation. This is some something that kind of gets overlooked, but if you have ingredients that you already know are going to do bad if you don't do anything with them, you can always preserve them for future use. No, this may require a little bit of prep that you may not have planned for, but it's it's still a worthwhile endeavor. You can freeze, you can pickle, you can dehydrate. There are so many creative ways to use product uh, that might only have a few days left in it. So now let's assume that you've successfully stored your ingredients and now you're ready to prepare them. You're going to cut, cook, and portion. It's really important to monitor yields and making sure that everyone is getting the same amount of usable food from ingredients during the prep process. Have you ever seen someone prepping veggies on your team and noticed that their scrap pile has a lot of usable food and it's maybe bigger than, than yours? That can be really frustrating. And some of the best ways to address this is through training, making sure you have posted guidelines, targets, pictures, or do some side-by-side -side training, especially with more inexperienced staff. And we'll come back to this in a minute. And another thing you can do is design recipes that use the whole ingredient. Um, for example, a roasted beet dish with sauteed beet greens so you don't throw away the tops. Um, you can use scraps like chopped kale stems instead of shredded cabbage, or you can use leftovers or surplus. Bread is a common culprit in restaurants. You might bake too much bread and it might not be as good as the second day on the second day, but there's so much you could do with it. French toast, bread pudding, soup, breadcrumbs, um, or croutons for a salad. 
And you also want to try to have some superhero recipes that can rescue your food and make use of smaller quantities of leftovers. A really classic example of a superhero recipe is actually stock. Most items like onion peels, meat trim, cheese rinds, all of that can go into a stock and it's just going to add so much flavor to everything else that you produce. Um, and some other superhero recipes that we like to think about are stir fries, fried rice, quiche even. And so here we have a little example of how much that prep food waste can have an impact on your bottom line. So um, Paris Crepery in Brookline uh, sells a lot of strawberries. You can imagine that in a, in a crepe business. Uh, so to make prep easy, they would do, uh, they would cut all the strawberries at once by lining them up. And so then they realized they were use, putting a lot of usable strawberry in the trash. And so they redirected the prep team to remove the green tops a little more carefully. Over the course of the year, they saved almost $3,000 by getting every bit of utility out of those strawberries. And it may not seem like a lot, but strawberries are just one of the dozens of fruits that they prep, not to mention vegetables, cheese, protein, etc. So my question to you today is, what are your strawberries and how much could you potentially save? There's probably, you know, one or two culprit ingredients in your own food business that if they just received a little bit more attention could result in some significant savings. So now all of your food is prepped and ready for service at known as your mise or mise en place. So we treat our mise just like our raw ingredients. You want to make sure that you're taking inventory of your mise and that you don't over prep, especially for highly perishable items. It's super important to label everything, even just the date and the initials of the person who prepped can make a difference. Um, you can do a lot more, including uh, the item name, what station it's for, what dish it's for, uh, but really the focus is on what, do you, what, what is the minimum information you need so that an item doesn't get lost or misidentified. And you wanna repurpose ingredients within reason. The guest experience is of course the most important thing, but let's say you have leftover roast chicken from a catering event that was never served and was kept at the proper temperature the whole time. It could become a chicken salad, a chicken soup lunch special, et cetera. And you can also adjust your sales strategies within reason. Uh, if you know that you have um, overstock of something, you can talk to your front of house staff about pushing those items during service that day. You can create small discounts um, and find ways to move product and make sure it's consumed by guests. So now service and beyond. You're feeding the guest and what do we have to keep in mind here? Portion control is really important. In the U.S., we are used to such big portions, and it can really lead to a lot of food waste. So making sure you're using appropriate plates and plating techniques that can make a dish look full and plentiful uh, can really help you out here. And pay attention to what goes back to the dish pit. What are guests not eating? This is a great way to, to find out how different ingredients are performing, one um, really popular example is of this restaurant that used to give a big mountain of French fries with the meal. And they, the dishwasher noticed that there were a ton of fries coming back and people just weren't finishing them. So they, they gave that feedback to their team. And so what they did is they moved to an unlimited refills policy with their French fries. So what happened? They were able to give much smaller portions to guests and it turns out that actually very few people took them up on that refill. So not only were they saving on prep and ingredients with those potatoes, but they were also minimizing the amount of food that was going in the trash. And uh, another way to mitigate waste uh, during service is of course leftovers. You wanna be able to provide appropriate take-home containers and sometimes even labels or reheating instructions as appropriate. And it can be uh, really important for your staff to make it appealing to take food ho home. Instead of using words like leftovers, they can say instead, do you want to, or saying, do you want to pack any of this up? They could say, which items are you going to take home? Something that normalizes it and makes it really easy for people to want to take their leftovers and even complimenting them like, oh, this is going to be a great breakfast or now you don't need to pack lunch tomorrow. So those soft sales strategies can help um, folks take their food with them. 
And we wanted to provide a little bit word off of what to do with food that has not been served and the options for reselling and donating. Um, if the rules will vary based on organization, but when you donate food, it's really important that it's items that have not been served. Um, for example, let's say there was a buffet and you put the food out, that for example, would not be eligible for donation. And it needs to have been held and stored appropriately. So raw ingredients are, would be appropriate, things that came out of me's and your prep would be appropriate, and things that have been fully prepared but not served. Um, so any catering that you didn't put out, for example, could be resold or donated. Um, and, I, and like I mentioned, any food that was plated or on a buffet would need could not be donated. And uh, in terms of finding folks to help you resell or donate, there are surplus food platforms like Too Good To Go um, that you could sign up for. And there are nonprofit organizations that take they tend to take much larger quantities, uh, but Love and Spoonfuls and Food for Free are great options, as well as community fridges. This is a terrific way to have impact on your very local community. Um, just make sure that everything is labeled and each fridge kind of has different requirements, but they should be pretty easy to follow. And also um, something that sometimes folks forget is your team can be a great place to pass on a uh, perfectly good food that can't that you're not ready to serve or that's surplus. Many restaurant workers are not only supporting their own families, but also their communities. So feeding them is definitely a perk of the job. And um, kind of what we were alluding to with that last slide, unfortunately, not all food can be rescued. So reducing and repurposing food waste can only go so far. And um, if you've already found ways to repurpose or redistribute to feed others, you might still have some waste remaining, but there are options for it. On the right, you'll see the food recovery hierarchy pyramid that illustrates some of those options. For restaurants that have already tried reducing and repurposing food, composting can be a really great option. And composting reduces methane emissions in landfills and returns nutrients to the soil. And so here are some organizations that directly work with restaurants. One important thing to keep in mind is that some of these composters will accept any composted material like compostable plates, napkins, and others focus specifically on food waste. Um, some use compost to generate electricity or repurpose waste in other means. So you will have to check with individual service providers to make sure that they accept the items that you are looking to have composted. And it's always great to uh, learn more about how they will be processing it. And so next, and perhaps most importantly, one of the biggest sources of mitigating food waste is leveraging your team. Education and creating a culture of sustainability is really important. Many workers, especially in restaurants uh, that are more mission focused, like May May or perhaps Be Good, Life Alive Clover, some of these ones that we've talked about, will probably have staff that is very motivated by sustainability to begin with. They are proud to know that your business is minimizing waste. So educating your team on, this, on these issues can really help them buy in. Also, it's important to do a little bit of reporting. Uh, what your measure, what you measure, can be improved. So make sure you're sharing the results with your team. Maybe you are weighing your compost or paying attention to the the portion yield. Those kinds of things. You can even turn it into a friendly competition. And really, again, really getting the team involved. Um, your team members are the ones that are doing the work, so they might really have some good ideas of areas for improvement. And you can provide, again, like I mentioned, some healthy competitions and some bonuses or prizes that can reinforce best practices. And most importantly is leading by example and making sure that in your training and coaching as an owner, you are providing step-by-step um, -step guides to how you want your team to, to be involved in, in, the, in the initiatives that you implement. So things to be sure to cover in training is that, for example, if you're expecting your team to bust tables and sort waste, make sure they know where everything belongs, uh, why it belongs there, and the importance of ca careful sorting. They should be able to set an example for guests and to answer questions. And so it's important to make sure that team members communicate these changes with positivity and are receptive to feedback that they will inevitably get from guests. 
So um, building on that, guest-facing employees are advocates. You want to make sure that you're preparing your team with appropriate responses and messaging to manage guest concerns um, because it's super important to the guest experience, especially when you're trying out a new initiative. For example, if a guest says, I really like the styrofoam containers better because they kept my food hotter, an employee could say, well, you know, styrofoam is bad for the environment. Or they could have a more advocate approach and say, thank you for the feedback. We're really excited about our improved packaging because it is more sustainable, but we'll let the management know um, about your feedback. Thank you for sharing. So taking these small opportunities to educate but not preach to your clients can help turn a frustrated guest into a loyal advocate and a returning customer. And we know we've already talked about this a little bit, but so many more consumers are aware and concerned about climate change. So getting your story out there matters. Not only can you save money, but you can also get more traffic through the door by um, sharing with folks the initiatives that you're taking on and getting them more invested in your business. And you can do this in a lot of simple ways, like just your signage and stickers. For example, if you walk into a Be Good, there's a chalkboard that tells you where um, they're, they're proteins or produce have come from and, and they list the local farm. You can post it on your website or social media. Um, you can put it in your newsletters. You can feature different vendors. You can feature um, Zero, your composter, whoever you might be using. And also make sure that you're talking to your customers and soliciting some feedback from them. They can help point out some important areas for improvement that you might not have been aware of. And if you feel like you've really killed it with um, making these improvements, reach out to the press and tell your story. It's always important to hear from independent businesses and how they're having a broader impact on our community and planet. So now we're going to summarize and wrap up. Um, the main things we hope you got from today's session is that greener practices are highly achievable and every little bit counts. This is one of those things where incremental change is absolutely more than acceptable. It's how we want you to get started. Um, and there's lots of resources, especially in places like Massachusetts. And there are so many values aligned partners out in our area. And staying open-minded, flexible, and creative so that you can continuously improve your sourcing and reduce food waste. And so, we wanna invite you to think about what you're gonna do first. Will it be using some imperfect ingredients? Will it be changing your inventory practices or perhaps even just donating some of your food? Make, make sure you're keeping track of that so you can get um, some tax benefits there. But there's so many ways that you can get started and hopefully um, today's session will have gotten you thinking about a couple of ways that you could do that. And, then, and that's all we've got for you today. Do we have any questions or anything you'd like to share about green practices that you're already implementing in your food business? Feel free to pop those in the chat. Carla, I'm going to come back online here too. And maybe if you are okay with it, while we've got some people that might be gathering thoughts or digesting some of the great information that we heard I might ask a question myself if that's okay yes please awesome um first there was so much great information here I was taking all kinds of notes and was giddy with how much I was learning and one of the things that I was sort of curious about I, I think the story that you told about um, the Paris Crapery reducing some of their waste by just changing the way that they were cutting up strawberries um, one of the things that I was sort of thinking of is that strawberries are, they're kind of small. They require a little bit of sort of finesse when you are handling some knife skills. Do you have any advice or suggestions for places that people might turn to for how to maybe give staff guidance if they maybe have some knife skills that need some brushing up or what the best way is to kind of keep your knife sharpened so that if you are asking staff to sort of change some of the ways that they're like physically doing things that that can be guided to them. Absolutely. Um, 
I think we we touched on this a lot. It really goes back to education. And so it's always an opportunity for owners to train and share with folks. Uh, but we know that that can be repetitive and the time is limited. Um, so one thing that works really well is actually filming your trainings. And you can get that camera really nice and close on your hands. And so people can rewatch it and practice as much as they need to. And you don't necessarily need to be there monitoring um, at every turn. And that and keeping track of yields very generally can also help people kind of get a sense like, okay, if I'm only getting, you know, half a strawberry out of this, uh, that's probably a problem. And so it just, it also highlights the areas where you as an owner are particularly concerned and those will be the ones that get attention. And in terms of knife sharpening, there's really excellent services that you can get for that that will bring you sharpened knives on a weekly, biweekly basis, whatever schedule that you need. That's awesome. Thank you. I hadn't even thought about the possibility of utilizing video like that. And it makes all kinds of sense because we're on video right now. <laughs> As people are still gathering their thoughts, I might have maybe one more question if we have time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I loved the uh, advice about approaching farmers that you might be interested in working with at farmer's markets. And I know that those can be really busy places. And I know that even just sometimes approaching someone during a moment of downtime, even that can sometimes feel like a little bit fraught. So do you have advice for like uh, in that moment of like how to approach a farmer and ideas to start engaging them with on like is it best to just sort of be like hey I've looked at your produce and I really like what you do would you be ever interested in offering something a little more wholesale like to the to the novice who maybe hasn't had that conversation yet like what are some great starter phrases to to kick off that combo I think you definitely hit the nail on the head. It's uh, just approaching with like, hey, is, do you guys wholesale and introducing yourself? And I get, yes, uh, I live in Roslindale and we have a super busy farmer's market. Uh, and so just even have, asking for a moment of like, hey, what's the right person to reach out to? And just getting some contact information. If they're like, oh, just use our, our web form because, you know, Alice, who's our lead farmer, she's always checking that and she'll get back to you. At least you've kind of gotten a name, you have like a directive, or maybe they're like, oh, my colleague over here is actually the person you want to talk to. That just quick moment can create an opportunity of connection and they've seen your face. Um, and so you can carry on this conversation later over video, over phone, over email, et cetera. But like now you're a human and not just like an email out in the ether that's easy to ignore. That is excellent advice. I know that if I were feeling sort of shy or a little nervous about like taking that step, like if I had a farmer who was maybe like, yeah, talk to this person, they deal with it. I might initially be like, oh no, like I did something wrong. Like maybe I said the wrong thing, but I recognize like hearing you say it, like everyone's busy in that moment. They have people, an army of folks to help manage this stuff. And so potentially getting passed to somebody else is actually like the best possible thing for you. Definitely. And those farmer relationships can just go so deep insofar as um, if you are have a really close relationship, they will even send you seed catalogs. So you can say like, oh, hey, for next season, we heavily rely on this particular type of produce or we want to experiment with this variety of, of beets. We always go back to beets. That's a fan favorite. Um, and starting to get involved like at the pre-planting level is really special. And so you never know how far it, it'll go. And, and maybe it doesn't make sense for your business to, to go that deep with your farmer. But again, establishing those human connections just really makes a difference. And it's something that you can carry forward to your guests. That makes a lot of sense. We've been um, continuing to monitor and it doesn't, oh, sorry, I'm on a busy street. You'll hear the background noise. We don't have any other questions from folks yet. Excellent. Well, thank you all the same um, to folks that joined us today and folks that might be watching us online at a later date. If you would like to learn more about PrepShift and how we could directly work with you or your food business, um, please shoot us an email at hello at prepshift.app. And also, we really would appreciate your feedback if you could help us by completing our three-minute survey. I promise it is actually three minutes or less um, by scanning the QR code or putting this link in your browser. It really helps us improve our content and continuing to bring uh, information that is helpful to restaurant owners who we really want to support. 
And so thank you again, Christina and City of Cambridge um, EODD for hosting us today. We're so happy to be here. Thank you very, very much, Carla. I can't tell you how wonderful it was to have all this information in one place, to get information that felt like it was approachable and understandable. I felt like so many things were kind of demystified for me, you know, whether it was like being able to better understand what I'm seeing on labels or better able to understand what I'm seeing in terms of the marketing and the storytelling that's going on with restaurants right now. The whole section on seafood just blew my mind. So thank you for um, providing us with all this expertise and this information today. And we can't wait to meet back again next week for our next session. It's absolutely our pleasure and we'll see you next week. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.